Hi, and welcome to Synchronicity, talk radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and today we are speaking with Maureen Healy. Maureen is the author of The Emotionally Healthy Child, Helping Children Calm, Center, and Make Smarter Choices. Maureen is a sought-after speaker, educator, and leader in the field of children's emotional health. She also has a popular blog on psychology today, which has reached millions of parents and educators who want to learn the how of raising emotionally healthy children. She's also the author of Growing Happy Kids, and she works with parents, educators, and children. Children all over the world. You can find her at growinghappykids.com. Welcome to the show, Maureen. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being with us. So you were a little bit of one of those kids that was kind of a pain. How did you get into working with children now as an adult? Yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't call it a pain, but I was certainly <laughs> a child with big emotions and big feelings and sort of, you know, didn't have, you know, we didn't have that sort of social emotional learning that they're doing nowadays when I was in school. So it was sort of like trial and error. Yeah. Awesome. Of like, you know, what you do with your big feeling. Yeah. And so how did you, I'm curious to know when you finally started to learn how to deal with your, your big feelings. Cause you're right. It wasn't something that most people learned even in their families. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it was just as you know, as I was growing up, like many of us that are adults now, we sort of learned it trial and error. So you I learned when I was young, that I could climb the tree in the backyard, and I'd feel relaxed. And you know what I mean? So, but nowadays, I think that we can be more deliberate or conscious about it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that the talking about climbing the tree and relaxing, Kids and adults these days seem to be less connected to nature. We're, we spend a lot of time indoors. I've been indoors all day. It's the first sunny day in a while here in Vancouver, and yet I've been cooped up inside all day. So do you have any tips for people on as far as like disconnecting from their devices? Or what do you think? Do you even think that that's part of the problem? Well, yeah, in my book, The Emotionally Healthy Child, I definitely have a section about devices and if we think of emotional health as like the skill of balance and you know if when we get off balance just how do we get ourselves back to balance oftentimes devices get us off balance and meaning you know that we instead of having that human connection or going outside and just being in nature and calming and relaxing depending upon where we live it's easier or harder but um you know, we get, there is that addictive sort of bump yet you get the feel good feelings in your brain when you go online. And you're like, oh, look, I have all these likes or my friend said this message. And so learning how to have a healthy relationship with devices is really important. Mm -hmm. So where does a parent start? Because I feel like, you know, you can tell kids how to do things and how to take care of their emotions. But if the adults in their lives are a hot mess, the, the kids are going to be, too. Yeah, and that's exactly right. And that's where you start, which is exactly what you said. It's like, you know, it's like when someone tells us something, especially if children, if we tell kids like, hey, do X, Y, Z, they just hear blah, blah, blah. But if we show them, you know what I mean? And we really have a good role modeling and it takes practice. None of us are perfect. Um, even if, you know, during dinner, we have a basket next to the dinner table and we say, all right, everyone's phone goes in the basket while we eat dinner. And it could be 20 minutes. It could be 25 minutes. It's not long, but it's helping them, you know, really value other things as well. Thank you. So maybe we can get to the definition of what exactly a healthy child looks like or behaves like or thinks like. Sure. And obviously the, you know, an emotionally healthy child is, you know, it's sort of a complex, sophisticated topic, but certainly it starts with the learning how to express them constructively. So... Um, you know, and then it, it goes into different things like, gosh, you know, your mindset, your values, um, social interactions. But the beginning point of an emotionally healthy child, then adult, of course, is really learning how to identify emotions and, and sort of calm and slow and uh, make healthy choices with what to do with them. And then if we think about it as the skill of balance, like I said earlier, it's really coming back to balance. How do we come back to balance? Whether you're angry, sad, frustrated, jealous, any different emotion. So it sounds like being able, an emotionally healthy child is able to 
feel an emotion. So something happens, they feel an emotion, and they're able to take a step back from it, identify that emotion, and then soothe themselves. Yeah, I would say a child who's learning how to be emotionally healthy is learning how to identify emotions. You know, it's easier, it's better to do it when they're smaller versus bigger. We all know a child that got frustrated and then two seconds later they had epic anger, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's learning how to slow emotions down a little and then decide, you know, identify them and what to do with them. That's, that's right. That's the beginning point for sure. And if we think of emotional health, it's more sort of flexibility. You know, you have emotional flexibility, you know, because life doesn't always get go the way it's planned or the way we think, you know, you have a, as a child, you have a substitute teacher, you know, or you're in the car with your mom and she says, oh, we have to stop and drop this at UPS. And then, you know, instead of being really angry and frustrated, you say, okay, we can, we can go with that flow. You know what I mean? And if you think of the opposite of emotional health, it's really more rigidity and getting stuck on things. And also, um, you know, if opposed to expressing your emotions constructively, you're expressing them destructively, slamming doors and screaming and doing all those sort of reactive things that is where a lot of people start, but you can learn how to do it differently. And you, so it sounds like you're talking about, uh, in your book, you refer to that more as a, a kid who's running hot with their anger and, and reactivity, but also on the other end of the spectrum is, is kids who maybe do say, oh, okay, it's fine if we go to UPS, it's fine if we delay dinner, it's fine if we do all these things that neglect my needs, and rather than getting angry, they're they're still not balanced because they're putting up with too much. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I guess I would say there is, it's always about trying to come back to balance, right? So whether you're hot with anger or cold with sadness, it's always, how do you come back to your center? And you do need to learn how to be flexible as a child. It's sort of the nature of the world, but you know, there's also, like you're saying, there's a point where you have to speak up for yourself too. So, um, you know, that's why emotional health is sophisticated, right? And every child has their natural tendencies, whether it's to internalize and just hold things in and repress them. And that wouldn't be emotional health if you said it to go, oh, it was a fine day and it wasn't a fine day. So learning how to express things constructively as they're happening or finding appropriate outlets for them is really the start of emotional health. Awesome. So there's, um, what is, I'm trying to find the, the section. Uh, where there's three simple steps. Maybe we can go over the, the stop, calm, and make a smarter choice. Sure. Yeah, one theme throughout the book of the emotional health of the child is that if we apply these three steps, which are conceptually simple, but we all know in practice they're harder, um, you know, it's one, it's, you know, how do we catch ourselves, right? Or as a child, how do you help your child catch him or herself? And then two, it's how do you calm? Because typically, you know, no great choices are made when you're, not calm. And then three, it's how to make a smarter choice, which is a choice that's good for you and good for others. So for, for example, there's a child that worked with, you know, he would get angry in the classroom. So he'd throw his notebook and hit another kid. It was good for him because he got anger relief, but clearly not good for the other child. So nor the whole classroom. So it's really learning how to make choices that are good for you and good for others. That's where, you know, life comes down to choices. And you can learn how to make good choices even when you are emotionally challenged, whether it's frustrated, angry, jealous, upset, whatever emotions you're having. Thanks, Maureen. So I'm curious when there's kids acting out in the classroom and stuff and, and then you get called in to, to support them, how often is it that there's something else going on in the family? Or is this just, I mean, kids obviously need time to learn how to manage their emotions. Yeah, I mean, certainly sometimes it has to do with something else, whether it's the family or something happened at recess or something else happened that they're just frustrated with and it comes out sideways in the classroom. And other times they, you know, they could be a perfectionist and they certainly um, just don't know how to sort of let that go. And they, it's a skill they have to learn that, you know, you have to do your best and let the let go of the rest because if you want everything to per be perfect and that's the only way you'll be happy, you're sort of setting yourself up for unhappiness. So every child is different, but a lot of times it's really, I always think of children who are what most people would say behaving badly would be, you know, they just don't have the skills yet. They don't have the knowledge and the skills yet. So when kids learn what to do with their emotions, they want to do it because they want to feel good too. Mm -hmm. 
I'm just thinking as as you're saying that kids still like are just learning how to deal with their emotions. I mean, I see people on a regular basis who are in their 40s, 50s and 60s. They still don't know how to deal with their emotions. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, you make a good point, which is I think a lot of people think of emotional health. It's like a box you want to check and that it's done. But it's something that we just deal with all over our lives. And everyone has different capacities and skill sets. And sometimes certain people are learning one type of emotion, whether it's how to deal with resentment or anger or shame or, you know what I mean? They're learning throughout their lives. So I know that, you know, we have the knowledge and awareness on what to do with emotions and how to heal from upset. So the sooner we teach kids that, you know, the, the better off they are, because like you're saying is oftentimes when you don't learn as children or you don't have great role models, you're dealing with it as sort of challenges in it as an adult. Mm -hmm. So do you find that a lot of your, your child clients end up teaching the rest of their family? Oh, absolutely. Interestingly, enough I think a lot of times that you know when children learn different tools and strategies they say you know they come home and they do them and or they say you know like for example if you make a peace corner in, in your home like a place where a child when they're upset they can go to the corner they can come down and reset themselves you know if that's something that they can do oftentimes they'll walk in the house and say hey mom you need about 10 minutes in the peace corner and they're <laughs> right right you know we all have big feelings so it's, you know, a practice. It's not perfection. Mm. So thank you, Ma Maureen. And the, the Peace Corner, that sounds interesting because I know a lot of kids, or a lot of people who are my age, when we were kids, we were put in the corner and it was not a way to be peaceful. It was a way to be shamed. Right. So okay. can we talk right. a little bit yeah. about the and difference? Sure. I mean, the whole idea and, and, and the reason why um, in my book, The Emotionally Healthy Child, I have so many strategies for parents and teachers. Is the whole goal is to help teach children how to help themselves deal with emotions on their own because we can't be with them all the time. So when they're in their classroom or at their friend's house. So the Peace Corner, the idea is it's a place that's not punitive. It's a positive place, constructive, that has, you know, it can have music, it can have their books, it can have... Play-Doh, it can have all sorts of different things that just help them calm and reset themselves. And it's somewhere where they can learn to take themselves so that when they're feeling big emotions, they go over there and maybe it's in their bedroom. It may not be a, a corner in the house, but it might be one place that they go that they have all the tools and ideas that help them sort of learn how to reset so that it's not, it's not a punishment. It's just a part of life, you know? And... And I think it's a good thing, you know, as adults and parents to help be with the children and say, hey, you know, honest with them. Say, hey, you know, I didn't have a really great day. I probably could use time in your peace corner or I'm going to take some deep breaths. This is what I'm going to do. But I I'm with you there. Not every moment is perfect. And learning how to come back to balance or our center is important. Mm. Thank you, Maureen. Right now, we are speaking with Maureen Healy. She is the author of The Emotionally Healthy Child, Helping Children Calm, Center, and Make Smarter Choices. You can find her at growinghappykids.com. So I'm curious, we're talking about kids resetting and going back to balance and taking care of themselves through going to their room or doing something to, to calm down. So how do you balance that with parents also finding ways to emotionally soothe the child, like giving them hugs or speaking calmly to them. Where, where's the boundary of parental soothing and self-soothing? Well, I think it has to do with age and a child's personality. I mean, um, typically four and up is when logic comes online. So before the child is four, they're, you know, you, it's, you know, it's hard to be like, talk, you know, not all children, but most children, it's, you know, they're, they're very, very emotional, they're very reactive. But older than four, you can have more logical um, decisions, and you can help them use both their right and left brain when they're making choices. But what I would call, it's called co-regulation, when you, you know, give a child a hug, and you get you, you pat their back, you're helping them regulate their emotions with them. So they're leaning on you to come back to center. And I think by the age of six or seven, you really want to help them begin to do that on their own because that's when they're going to school and they really need to learn how to do it on their own. So 
you know, between four and seven, it's that process of um, really regulating with them, but also guiding them to learn how to do it on their own. And that doesn't mean at seven, you stop giving them hugs and pats on the back and, you know, soothing them and saying, hey, you know, we can we can do this differently or we can, you know, it's just that we're also having an expectation when they're at school that they can begin to do this on their own when you're not around as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it sounds like it's kind of, I mean, you're not taking away all of the emotional soothing of, of giving them physical comfort, but you're kind of just the same as when you're weeding, weaning a, a kid off of um, being bottle fed and you're transitioning them into eating solid food. It's sort of a gradual phase. Right, right, right. And every child's different. They'll be, you know, I mean, we all love hugs. It's a good thing, but you know, it's, it's one of the those things that's just like you said more independence as they grow so yeah i imagine it it is very difficult being at school um without without your parents and and navigating that can be so overwhelming i'm just trying to even remember what it felt like being such a tiny person showing up in this mm. school full of mm. all these people um yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, and you know some kids you know, they just, their knee-jerk reaction is to cry. And I have no problem with kids crying, even if it's in the classroom, but I want them to make deliberate choices. So just giving them these strategies and tools helps them realize they have a choice in that moment. You know what I mean? They don't have to just cry. There's other things they can do. They can take deep breaths. They can go to the bathroom and splash water on their face. Like whatever the emotion is that they have a choice on how to handle it. And that probably also depends on their teacher and their classroom environment, because not every kid can go to the washroom and to take care of themselves. Some teachers won't allow that. Yeah, I mean, certainly you have to work with the rules of a school, for sure. But I mean, like deep breaths, you can always take a deep breath. It's, it's invisible and your breath is always with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, so there's always a way to give kids tools to help them learn how to really regulate their emotions in a way that they feel good about it. Like we, the whole goal is not to give them those, you know, dunce corner punishments. You know, we want them to feel good and learn that it's natural to have all your emotions. And, it, you know, it's really just what you do with them that matters. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Maureen. So can we talk about what it looks like to make smarter choices um, for kids? I mean, are we talking about like life choices or choices not to throw that book at the other kid? What do, what do you mean by choices? I mean, it's everything that we're talking about. Yeah. But, you know, since we're focused in on emotional choices, so we're talking about, you know, when a child has big emotions, you know, how do you help them make a good choice? We all know that you know, when you're angry, I've seen kids punch hole in the wall. You know, I've seen other kids throw another kid, throw a rock at the kid's head or sadness. You know, I've seen kids, you know, just withdraw and not connect with others and really isolate themselves, which is which which isn't healthy either. So it's helping them make smart choices. And from my perspective, it's really just I have something called the smart choices checklist in the book. So it's, it's before an event occurs, you know, you say, what can you do, you know, with your big feelings? What helps you calm? You know, can you j go outside and jump on the trampoline for 10 minutes and I'll set a timer? Do you want to read your favorite book? Do you want, you know, what is it that can help you bring, bring yourself back to center? Maybe it's a favorite music song. Maybe it's, you know, so it's different for school and home. But usually a child has an issue at one or, the, one or the other places. Oftentimes kids are really good at school, but then at home they kind of let it all out, you know? So it's what do you do with them at home when they're really frustrated? Maybe they just need a half an hour to decompress. You know, it's helping them create these healthy habits that they can not only use today, but they're beginning to pick up habits, you know, coping skills for their life. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, Maureen, if you have different different skills and go-to strategies for home or school, do the teachers often have that list of things so that maybe they can remind the kid, hey, it seems like you're upset. Did you want to do one of the things on your list? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And that's exactly right. So if I had a child that was having these big emotions and, you know, say they ran hot and they got really frustrated too, you know, easily, I would have the teacher have the list. And like you said before, when she saw something was possibly happening, say, all right, why don't you pick something from your list? That's exactly right. 
so that we can, you know, the whole goal is to have them have constructive outlets to express their emotions. So I'd rather have them pick something and proactively do it. And some teachers, you know, in the classroom will just, you know, the start of school there, the whole classroom does some deep breaths together just to get everyone on the same page because lots of kids have been rushing to school, other kids, you know, so just helping everyone calm together, you know, or after recess, how do we kind of get back into the classroom mode? Nice. How many teachers are doing that now? Because that would have been really valuable for us as kids, hey? I totally agree. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of teachers that are doing it because, it, you know, it's uh, from my perspective, it's really low-hanging fruit. It doesn't take much. And it, it, it pays a lot of dividends because you, we all know that you can't get to academics if you have a child that's really upset and angry or frustrated. You know, you just can't get there yet. Absolutely. I'm trying to get that kind of thing happening at work at my place of work because we work in a very stressful environment and we also need to model for our clients emotional regulation skills. And if we come in, we're all frazzled, then we're not going to be dealing with them as calmly as we could. Right, right. I've heard of some certainly some workplaces I know of that use meditation rooms that do actually on the company's, you know, clock, allow the the employees to do like 20 minutes meditation or even 15 minutes because it gets them calm. So they have the capacity to handle, like you said, some of these challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And I I also, as I'm reading through your book, um, some of the I love the idea of giving your angry side a name. I feel like some of these skills could be useful even for for teaching adults. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, the whole idea is that, you know, you aren't your feelings. Your feelings come and go. So the more you can distance yourself from your feeling, like most people say, I am angry. And uh, you want to say something like, I am feeling angry because you are not your anger. You're just feeling that emotion. Mm. So when you give it a distance, and for me, I would say, you know, my name's Maureen, but I go by Mo. So you go, oh, that's Monster Mo is coming now. You know, that's my anger. I give it that anger name. And then then it can be a little more lighthearted. You know what I mean? You can say, oh, Monster Mo is back. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, what do I do with it? You know, and that helps a child create distance, too. So they aren't that, quote unquote, bad kid or that, you know what I mean? They just having a big feeling and that's your that's the emotion you're having now. How, what do you do with it? Hmm. And that's, I imagine, like identifying with our emotions as an angry kid or sad kid or, or whatever makes us start thinking, yeah, that like I'm an angry person. If we're constantly right. saying, oh, I'm angry, I'm angry. If that's how we are most of our day, well, then we must be an, uh, just an angry type of person. Right. And that's not the truth, you know. So helping them just saying, like, I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling frustrated or I'm, you know, and especially when you're building someone's self-esteem, you know, I can't do anything. I'm no good. You know, like, no, no, no. We're all learning. You know, you have to help them really perceive their world correctly and have a wider perspective because they're young and they don't know yet. So that's okay. You just want to help them have a healthy relationship, not only to their emotions, but to their self. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So one of the things I found interesting too, um, is the, something you said in your book is the secret to success is embracing discomfort. Can we talk a bit about Mm -hmm. that? Sure. Well, I mean, especially if we're teaching kids, I have a chapter in my book about seven ideas of how emotions work, which are good for adults and children. But, you know, you're they're learning how emotions work and then what to do with them. But, you know, to handle some of these emotions, you really need courage and you need to be able to be able to handle discomfort or being uncomfortable. So it's it's not easy to face fear or anger. You have to be able to be uh, learn how to be uncomfortable, okay with it, and then navigate through it. But even specifically, if I think back to my own life, like when I was really younger, I remember my parents took me to the Macy's, you know, Thanksgiving Day Parade, which was amazing. But it was really uncomfortable to get on the subway or the train and be with millions and millions of people. 
But when I got through the discomfort of it, I could get to the other side, which was really, oh, my God, this is amazing. You know what I mean? So often on the other side of discomfort are these amazing experiences. But we have to help our children get through the discomfort. And there's, I can think of one child client I work with who's very perfectionistic. And, you know, we played Clue together, which I, the board game. And I knew it was a little bit, I knew she'd probably lose just because of her age. And, um, but I could work with her one-on-one -on -one and she lost, but she can move through her discomfort in a safe setting so that I could help her realize, okay, that's okay. You're bigger than your discomfort. You can try again. You know, it's okay. It's, we were all uncomfortable sometimes. So helping kids learn how to be somewhat comfortable with discomfort or somewhat okay with it, recognizing they're bigger than it will help them in the long run. Hmm. Does that make sense? It does. And it's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm noticing so many times in my life that, yeah, like I don't ski because it's just way too much hassle to get to like the top of the mountain and like, I didn't, especially because I don't right. have a car. And so I miss out on, you know, these, these events that are lots of fun, but they take a lot of discomfort to get there. And I feel like our society is, I mean, we're all really addicted to comfort, right? I mean, we, mm -hmm. we don't even go shopping anymore. Right. Because mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. discomfort of like going there and finding the thing is out of stock. Well, why would I do that when I can just sit in my pajamas right? and buy right. it online? <laughs> right. And that's why, I mean, I used to live in India, so I have a certain different mindset. I mean, you know, when I landed in New Delhi, India, they're like, okay, now you go on a train for 12 hours with no bathroom. I mean, they'd stop on the side of the road, but that's, to me, that's discomfort. So it is why we travel and we, so we have a wider perspective, right? So we come back and realize, oh, you know, we do have it pretty good here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah. But not everybody has that experience, the, the experience of traveling or the, the financial right. means to travel. Right. And I feel like that's something that we're just getting more and more used to. I mean, even when I think Louis C.K., uh, the, the comic, he was on a talk show one day sharing about how they had just come out with Internet on the, the airplane and it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And the person sitting right. next to him was like upset that it wasn't working. And he's uh -huh. like, this was just invented. And you're right. already like feeling entitled to it. Right, 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 right. But, but yeah, even if you watch a documentary, but I mean, just learning about the world, you know, we begin to appreciate, wow, even like you said, having a different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And then gratitude will always sort of put us in the right direction, even when we think things aren't that great, like, right? You know, it's amazing that we ever could use the internet on a plane, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So how do you, so what are some strategies to help kids to get more accustomed to discomfort and embrace discomfort? Right. So the important point is to do it in a safe and comfortable setting, which is sort of why I gave the example of like playing a board game, especially one that's either a little too hard or your, you know, your child's going to lose and be upset about, you know, you do it in a setting that makes, that makes sense that they realize that I, like in that situation, I could help that girl through her discomfort. I knew that, you know, her losing was going to be really upsetting to her. She was really uncomfortable. So I could help her through it and learn from the experience. So you want to do it in a way where, you know, your child's safe, but something that, you know, it could even be going somewhere new, you know, go because a lot of kids, you know, you, you've never done anything before. You're nervous. You're uncomfortable. And that's OK. That's normal. But we have to work through that discomfort. So what what would that look like? So you're playing this the game with the, the girl and she's starting to get upset. So what do you what does that sound like and look like? Sure. So, I mean, she lost and you could tell she I could see her wanting to cheat to win. But I caught her and I said, no, we, we, I said, we're not cheating. You know what I mean? And then she lost and then she was just, you know, she looked uncomfortable. I said, it's okay to lose. I sort of just coached her emotionally. I said, you know what? We all lose. That's how we learn. I mean, the only time that something's a failure is that when we don't learn from it. So the nature of learning is by doing something and not, you know, succeeding in it and trying again, and developing more skills. And I also sort of coached her on the idea that, you know, our goal in life is to give our best and let go of the rest. It's not to be perfect. If, or if you're only happy when you're perfect, you're going to be unhappy because things aren't perfect on the planet. Mm -hmm. So when she could kind of make that shift in her mind, and it's a practice 
because, you know, if you're a perfectionist, that's just part of your nature. So you're, it's, you're practicing, learning how to just do the best and let it go, you know? And the idea is that you want to do great work, and that's great, but you don't want to do it at the expense of your happiness. You know, you want to still feel good. Thanks, Maureen. Is there any research or, or what do you think it is that causes some kids to be perfectionists? Um, that's a good question. I think it's part of their personality. You know, there's we're all sort of patterned for our purpose. And some kids, you know, their parents aren't perfectionist. You know, it's not like it's genetic. You know what I mean? They just feel it's sort of a mi- let's put it this way it's a misperception a lot of people think that oh you know i'll be happy when you fill in the blank and sometimes some people think i'll be happy when my house looks perfect or when i get all a's in my class or fill in the blank but when we realize that that doesn't actually make us any happier that you know it is by doing our best and having meaningful relationships and and you know i mean happiness is pretty darn important but that's not even the best either you want to be a whole person you want to feel all of your feelings you know so some days are lemons and you get to make lemonade and other days are just lemons. But being able to be authentic and real about what you're feeling and, and, and you know, continuing to get up when you fall and doing your best is really the goal. Um, so perfectionism is, is just part of someone's personality. Okay. Thank you. Because, yeah, I know that for me it's it's a constant battle to, like, because there's this perception of, well, if I'm not going to immediately be good at it, then I don't even want to try, which is not, right. I mean, how are you ever going to get good any, at anything if you don't try? Right. And a lot of kids have that. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I mean, it's also a lot of children have that and they're, and, and it's hard as a child too, because like you just said, you have to try different things because you don't immediately know what you're interested in the world and where your talents are and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, what about the the parents and the, the kids? There's there's this new phenomenon. Well, I guess it's not that much that new now, but it's these overscheduled kids. Like when, right. when you and I were kids, we just like go outside and play mm-hmm. with no agenda. That seems to have changed now. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I see it in my own practice because I work on Sundays sometimes because can't fit people in during the week they're just too busy um so you know and every child is different some kids really love to be busy and other kids don't but I do think there needs to be the ability to calm and relax that's very important for emotional health especially you know like we talked about the three steps how do you catch yourself before you go in a not so smart direction how do you calm and then make a smarter choice children really do need to learn how to calm and relax it's sort of like resets themselves so I think that it's really healthy to have that balance it sort of all comes back to balance right when you're over scheduled you're out of balance and sometimes it's a nature of you know hey you're a mom with three boys and they all have sports so you're just running around but sometimes it's you know something within our control that we can say all right well instead of doing x and y why don't you just do x this this season you know so i think we have to strive for that balance for them too Mm mm-hmm We are speaking right now with Maureen Healy. She is the author of The Emotionally Healthy Child, Helping Children Calm, Center, and Make Smarter Choices. You can find Maureen at growinghappykids.com. So what about, we've got the the overscheduling. Is there value? Some people say that there's value in being bored. What's your opinion on that? I I think... I mean, I've really never been bored in my life, but I know that, except, except, let me, that's not true. I've been bored when I was in school, when I was young, and I thought, oh my God, how am I going to make it through this history class? How am I going to make it through it? And, and I think, you know, when you're not interested in something, you can be bored. But I also think the idea of giving a child or even an adult, you need that creative space to do nothing so that you can come up with your own ideas. You can use your imagination. You can... Um, you know, you can you can kind of ponder and be, you know, really be alone with your thoughts and things like that. I think if you don't have that, that space to be creative, I think um, I don't know. I think it's it, I think life isn't as fun. Mm hmm. Well, and then, I mean, I know sometimes that I if I'm super scheduled all the time, then I get a day off and it feels really uncomfortable because I don't know what to do with myself. 
Mm, right. 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 Yeah. And I think that yeah, these days. It's good not, not to run around sometimes. I mean, I think it's, if it's possible, right? I mean, when you have a day off, does it feel good or it just feels weird? Um, well, it, it depends on the day. But I mean, sometimes I, I have to actively have compassion for myself that I don't have plans. Because right. I've, you know, we have this feeling like we should have something scheduled, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. And it's like, no, it is okay to just stay home and read a book. I don't have totally. to be out because it's totally. Saturday night and, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're human beings, not human doings. So I think that the being part is gets lost sometimes in our world. That's true. Mm-hmm. Well, we're getting close to the end of the show. I'm wondering what you'd like to focus on next, Maureen. What do you think is important to t- cover? Um, I think it's important that, you know, everybody learns that uh, or knows that emotional health is a skill to learn, that it's not just a product of great parents or great genes or the great, there were, I was born into the right family, although, of course, those things help, but it's really a skill to learn. So it's like going to the gym and building a muscle. You know, you learning the ideas of how emotions work and how to express them constructively it can be done for any adult, um, most adults, let's say. And, 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 and learn earlier on or really just put on a positive trajectory. And it really is the first step to becoming happier. You know, if you learning how to master your emotions and learning how to express them constructively. Mm-hmm. And I do also work, I have a specialty with highly sensitive children. So I do work a lot with those types of kids. Ooh, wonderful. We can talk about that. Um, But I also want to say that people can go to your website, growinghappykids.com, if they want a sample chapter of the book as well, right? That's right. So that's growinghappykids.com. We can just sign up for the mailing list there. And so, yeah, let's talk about highly sensitive kids. What's So what's the difference between highly sensitive kids and regular kids? Because I feel like kids seem more sensitive today. They are more sensitive today, absolutely. Um, when I say highly sensitive, I'm talking about emotionally sensitive, although they could be physically sensitive and sensitive in, in lots of ways. But, you know, they're feeling deep emotions and they're reacting to them quickly. So do you deal with a lot of kids who are on the spectrum? And would that fall under highly sensitive? Right. So there's a big umbrella of of highly sensitive children. Um, And these are the kids that, you know, they fall off, you know, the swing at the playground and they start crying, opposed to just shaking it off and getting back up and going again. So they're just more sensitive to life. And um, autism or Asperger's kids, what we would say on a spectrum, the spectrum, um, would fall under the highly sensitive umbrella, but I, I personally work with more neurotypical children. So kids that just have big feet, you know, it's, it's your, it ties into the book, the emotionally healthy child It's because it's kids who have these big feelings, but don't know how to do, you know, what to do with them, but they're very fast moving and they have, um, you know, they're very sensitive to what people say to them. They're very sensitive to, the lights in the classroom. So it's physical sensitivities, emotional sensitivities, mental sensitivities. If they would be, if they were bullied, they may have damaged self-esteem. I still work a lot, a lot with, um, bullying situations. So, yeah. And does it seem like bullying? I don't know if we have like accurate statistics, but is bullying getting worse or better? You know, that's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that either. I can just say from my experience that it's been really consistent with the number of kids that come into my office that have been bullied. So it seems just like a, a prevalent line throughout elementary school that it happens and that, you know, some kids can shake it off and stand up for themselves. Other kids, they're, they are, you know, they have to switch schools. It becomes It becomes a really... Um, vulnerable and problematic situation. I mean, it's never good, but it's, it's you know, becomes really pr- problematic for certain children. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, depending on the child, they may have the strategies or skills on how to deal with it, and they might not. So that's where they really need a coach, a mentor, or, or someone to help them. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, these 
the it's so important that kids learn these skills as early as possible because throughout our lives more stuff happens and if we don't I mean there's always going to be bullies in the world so the more that we can build up our self-esteem and have compassion for ourselves and learn to how to cope with things that happen and how to stand up for ourselves in a way that is effective the better off we're going to be yeah and I mean even having compassion for the bullies to be honest with you I mean people bully or children bully because they were bullied they're passing it on and they don't yet have the self-awareness not to so you know learning learning that it's not it was there's nothing wrong with you oftentimes children make that faulty assumption there must be something wrong with me and there's nothing wrong with you you know so helping them really heal from these upsets are important as well as having a no tolerance for bullying at your school, you know, at schools, they need to say, that's it. There's no time, you know, there's, we don't accept that here. Mm -hmm. But that's, I mean, I think that it's good to have those policies, but that just because some, a school has that policy, it doesn't mean that subtle bullying doesn't still happen. True. But I, I definitely know schools that I've worked with where it it is, you know, it's always top down, right? So, you know, if the, if the principal or the people who are in charge of the school really say, listen, this is just something that we don't accept here. Do you know what I mean? That we don't, we don't do that here. Depending on the school, the kids learn not to do that there. Mm. It's not to say that there won't be a bullying incident here and there. Sure. Of course. But if, if they make it clear that these are our values, this is what we do in the school. And if there's a problem, this is what we deal with it. We don't, you know, some schools don't, don't even have, you know, punitive like detentions. They, now they have meditation rooms or they have, you know, talks, they have different things to do so that kids can learn how to reset themselves. So they're not, um, they're not faulted by having emotions or making mistakes and, you know, of course, we want to make mistakes that you can fix, but, you know, nonetheless. So it sounds, Maureen, like you're saying if if they really embody the culture of zero tolerance for bullying rather than because I know if we've all worked in companies and organizations where they say these are our values, where it's like these idealistic values that are never actually followed through on and the real the culture is not what they say their values are and everyone knows it's BS. But right. if but if the like you said top down if the principals and the and the school district and all the teachers are all modeling this then it just becomes part of the culture the kids just naturally adopt and it just becomes normal for them. Right, right. And and as long as they learn that, you know, they can make mistakes, that's okay. You know what I mean? That it's it's not, you know, it's, 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 you know, there's created more of an inclusive environment for like real learning, not just academics, but emotional. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this happened. So th this incident happened. So what are we going to do to work through it? And what did we learn? Right. That sort of thing. Right. Cool. And those schools do exist. I would not say they're in the majority. I understand that most, you know, but, but there is, you know, there is a change happening. Beautiful. So where do you see the world going um, if we get our kids emotionally healthy versus if we don't? Well, I mean, I work with kids and, you know, I'm very optimistic <laughs> because, you know, children are born, they're, you know, I would say, you know, the children have this bright, you know, positive energy to them and that I think that you know as that we they learn more and more early on how emotions work and how to express them constructively and you know other tools as well conflict resolution other things they have to add to their emotional toolbox uh you know the world will be in a different place it's not gonna you know war isn't going to be so prevalent all the sort of violence and things that come from unhealthy choices uh is and not that they haven't lasted forever but you know there, there'll be a change there'll be i'm not going to say it's going to eliminate all war but you know there'll be a shift towards more peacemaking and positive and smarter choices mm -hmm. so is there a target audience that we you know i mean does it need to be teachers who are teaching this does it need to be parents uh how do we get the message out in the most effective way yeah i would say parents and teachers i mean also professionals 
dealing with children, whether it's a pediatrician or a psychologist is helpful as well, but certainly parents and teachers are the two biggest groups that have such an, an amazing impact on children. Well, it's just about time to say goodbye. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up the show, Maureen? No, I'm so grateful for the time and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for being with us today. So we have been speaking with Maureen Healy. She's the author of Growing Happy Kids. And her latest book that we've been talking about today is The Emotionally Healthy Child, Helping Children Calm, Center, and Make Smarter Choices. You can go sign up for her mailing list and get a free sample chapter at her website, growinghappykids.org. Thank you so much to Maureen for being with us today. And thank you for spending this hour with us. I want to send you lots of love. Be well. Namaste.